Welcome to our workshop today on integrating civic learning in your course. Civic learning is an important component of higher education. Local, regional, and national civics impact citizens' lives. So integrating civic learning in the college classroom can assist student citizens in exploring how these different levels of civics are interconnected and integral to a healthy democracy and why they're meaningful to our students' lives. In this workshop, we'll talk about some strategies for integrating civic learning into your courses in relevant and meaningful ways. Um, not all of the strategies might work for your discipline, but hopefully at least you know one or two or, or more of the strategies you can figure out a way to incorporate if you're, you're wanting to integrate civic learning in your course. Um, some strategies discussed include classroom instruction in civics, service learning experiences, experiential learning, um, guided classroom discussion, and also participation in wider school governance. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I've been with CIDL for four years, but I've been at NIU off and on since 2008 when I began my graduate studies and was a graduate teaching assistant in the English department. Um, I've been teaching college English for 15 years and I earned my PhD in English from NIU in 2016. I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation, so if you have any specific questions related to what we're covering, feel free to post those in the chat thread. I'll address them as they come up. Um, any resources that I mentioned throughout the presentation as well, I'll post those links to the chat, but I'll also, for those of you attending today, um, and not just watching the recording, I'll send a follow-up email to you with those links too, so don't feel like you have to um, grab a hold of all of those links right away. All right, so let's get to know everyone who's here. Um, in the text chat, tell us, you know, where you're from, what's your role, what do you hope to get out of the workshop? And I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, great. So we've got some um, different disciplines represented here today, which is great. Um, something else that I'd like to do um, is to ask, this is something I do in my classes when I'm teaching online, um, but I also like to do this in my workshops just to model it. I like to do a check-in at the beginning of a workshop or the beginning of a class just to see where everybody's at. I also share my own emoji too so that everyone knows where I'm at as well. So search for an emoji. There's a little emoji icon underneath the say something space there in the chat. And you can pick, you can search for emojis at the top or you can pick, uh, scroll through and pick one. That represents how you're doing right now. And I will search through and find one as well. All right, great. All right, so thanks for participating with that. Um, our workshop objectives for today, we're going to talk about some practical strategies for how to define civic engagement, um, to explain the relevance of civic learning to higher education. Um, and Stephanie, you're working at, with middle school students um, as well. So I think these things could definitely be adapted for, for that audience too. Um, also identifying the benefits of civic learning, connecting civic learning outcomes to course goals um, or learning goals. 
discovering strategies to integrate civic learning in your courses, and that could be in and out of the classroom, and also addressing some challenges um, that you might encounter when you're incorporating civic learning. So the first topic that we'll cover is civic engagement in general, including what civic engagement is and how we can approach it more holistically. So here is a link for you. And I'm popping in the chat there and that's the same link that you can see there on the screen. Um, and this is uh, the link where this quote comes from, from ECS and NCLC. Um, civic education coursework should include opportunities for students to engage as citizens now, rather than focusing on how they may engage as citizens in the future. So essentially, students are citizens, so how can they engage as citizens um, in whatever capacity that they can? So, you know, if that's for middle, middle school students, on what level can they engage um, in civics? And then for college students, what level can they engage in civics as well? So here's just a, a graphic of civic engagement at a glance. Um, this is a model from University of Minnesota Extension. And according to the University of Minnesota, at the heart of effective civic engagement is a process that supports genuine discussion, reflection, and collaboration. So discussion would include both dialogue and deliberation. Um, discussion or dialogue is a discussion to promote understanding. Um, dialogue informs the deliberation. And then deliberation is discussion aimed at teach, reaching a decision. Um, so it re requires skills in listening and questioning and framing, uh, all of which are important to the civic engagement process. So this model begins with a public issue um, up there at the top, and then it moves to conveners and community preparing to address the issue. Then the process involves launching an inquiry, clarifying the issue, analyzing, identifying different options, synthesizing the data that you collect, making resourceful decisions, acting together to address the issue, and then finally enacting change. So um, again, from the University of Minnesota Extension, they have a holistic approach to civic engagement that consists of five stages. And those five stages are prepare, inquire, analyze, synthesize, and act together. So with prepare, you understand the context in which the issue will be addressed to assess community readiness. That phase ends with a decision to launch some sort of work on the issue using civic engagement, so public discussion, reflection, and collaboration. The inquire approach um, or stage is where you conduct a dialogue to better understand all of the different aspects of the issue. The presenting issues then explored and clarified to determine underlying issues that might be there, and then deliberation happens to frame that issue. Then we move on to analysis or analyzing. Um, so that's where we're fostering dialogue, we're exploring different perspectives and viewpoints, we're deepening our understanding of the issue even further, and we're deliberating with each other to generate some options. Then the synthesize uh, step is where we conduct a dialogue to align the clarified issue with the options that we've identified. Um, and we deliberate to reach a full decision and translate that decision into a plan. And then finally, we act together. So we use the created trust and the relationships that we've developed throughout this process to take some sort of collective action to address the issue, to implement what we've come up with. So that's just civic engagement um, in brief. Um, but let's talk now about civic learning specifically in higher education. And we'll go over the purpose of a higher education, the relevance of civic learning, and then what are the benefits of civic education. So first, the purpose of higher education. Um, a question, this question is posed in an article called the true purpose of a college education, um, in which Stephen Mintz asks some probing questions that get at the heart of the purpose of higher education. So he asks, are we doing enough to help students articulate the value of college 
beyond its employment and income outcomes. So he goes on to say, if most graduates think that a college education's essential value lies in career preparation, then we're doing a poor job of explaining our broader objectives, which is to produce culturally literate, well-rounded adults who are knowledgeable about the arts, the humanities, and the social behavioral and natural sciences, who can think critically, communicate effectively, argue logically, and solve complex problems. So um, in other words, the purpose of higher education has become lost a bit, um, and it's uh, kind of geared more towards job preparation now. And we need to, if we want, if we want it to mean more than that, just, than just career preparation, um, then we need to art, help articulate the value of college be, beyond that um, and what it, it prepares students to do. So um, civic education has been diluted over the years, um, as I mentioned, pushed to the back burner. Um, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Center for Innovation, Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, or CIRCLE, um, got together and they convened a diverse and dedicated group of civic thinkers to brainstorm strategies for revitalizing um, civic learning. Um, so they developed some promising practices um, for effective civic learning that were designed to help teachers create a civic curricula. Um, and this was mostly aimed towards um, K-12, um, but, you know, all of these things can can translate to higher education as well. Um, so they identified the necessary elements of effective civ civic education as including um, first classroom instruction in civics and government, um, in history, in economics, and law, in geography. Um, the second necessary element was service learning that was linked to classroom learning. Um, another element was experiential learning, um, and another was learning through participation um, in models of the democratic process or democratic processes. Um, and then another element was guided classroom discussion of, of current issues and events. And then the final piece was some sort of meaningful participation in school governance, um, particularly for um, those students who may be, you know, not able to participate fully in um, broader governance because may maybe their minors are under 18, they can't vote. Um, not that they can't get involved in, in civics um, without voting, though. So some of the benefits of civic learning um, According to the McCormick Foundation, Civic Blueprint was high quality school based civic learning um, that fosters civic knowledge, skills, and attitudes, promotes civic equality, and builds 21st century skills. It improves the school climate and it also helps to lower school dropout rates. Um, so, the benefits they identify that it fosters civic knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, it broadens and deepens civic knowledge. It hones those civic skills. It nurtures attitudes that all prepare students for informed, effective participation in our democracy. Um, it also promotes civic equality. Um, so not, not surprising that voter turnout is highest among white, affluent, highly educated Americans. Um, but universally available civic, civic learning opportunities can help us close that gap um, between who feels empowered um, and participates in voting. Um, it also helps us build 21st century skills. So students in interactive civics lessons work well with others. They're economically knowledgeable. They're literate with media. They're aware of current events, um, all of which are 21st century skills that they will need to um, engage with our democracy. 
Um, it also helps improve the school climate. So if we engage our students in civic engagement activities, they um, connect with the community and with each other. Um, they learn how to speak to each other respectfully. Um, they learn teamwork and they also learn to appreciate diversity. Um, and then finally, uh, lowers dropout rates. So if we engage students in real world civic learning opportunities, it does improve their chances of staying in school. So next we're going to go over a few specific ways to integrate civic learning in and out of the classroom. We'll talk about um, civic learning outcomes and then we can explore some specific strategies for incorporating civic learning in your courses. Um, so we'll we'll get to some ver some specifics and then maybe do a little bit of brainstorming about what you think would make sense for your discipline and for your students. Um, so I won't go over these in depth, but I will share in the chat the document that these are on that gives um, sample outcomes for each of these domains. Um, so civic learning outcomes, um, there's three different categories, civic knowledge, civic skills, and civic values. Um, in civic knowledge, an outcome would be, outcomes would be knowledge, comprehension, analysis, and synthesis. And then for civic skills, planning or implementation, communication, leadership, cultural competency, and evaluation. And then finally, with civic values, it's grounding, responding, and committing. Um, so you can take a look at the sample outcomes for each of those domains in that link um, that I posted there. That's also posted on the, um, the slide here for those of you not uh, in the session today but who are watching the recording. All right, so let's talk about classroom instruction in civics. Um, so with this, we want to provide instruction in, as they mentioned, the Clearinghouse mentioned, in government history, law, and democracy. Um, and you don't have to be teaching one of those topics in order to connect those things to your discipline. Um, so that is something that we need to do um in order to prepare our students for engaging with civics is to give them the context of that um, so the holistic approach then would be um, allowing students some time to delve into you know the hearts of these civic issues and the effects of those issues on society And then from there, we can talk about um, topical issues in our guided classroom discussions. So we want to incorporate our discussions of you know, current issues, local, national, international issues um, and events within the classroom um, in a guided way so that we have productive conversations about them um, rather than just you know, opinion based or reactionary ones. Um, but particularly, we want to talk about issues that um, our students view as important to their lives. So this will involve students in the process of coming up with those topics and those issues. So we want to, to engage our students in coming up with those issues um, and then maybe some guidelines for our students um, and with our students surrounding the discussion. So what will the discussions look like? What are the ground rules going to be? So we want to engage our students in creating those ground rules and those criteria for how we're going to um, uh, discuss these issues in the classroom in a productive way. Especially if we're um, using or including controversial issues. Um, so we want our students to be able to engage productively with those issues. Um, and to help them appreciate others' perspectives and understand um, you know, different viewpoints about those topics rather than engaging in you know, the echo chamber where they only hear their own opinions echoed back to them. And then, of course, we are going to be the moderators of those discussions um, so that we can kind of enforce what the students have come up with as our parameters for the discussion. 
and ensure that they stay productive and respectful. Um, one way that we can incorporate um, civic learning in our classes when strategy is models and simulations of democratic processes. Um, so we can give students uh, the opportunity to participate in, you know, things like mock elections or moot courts or um, problem solving activities, um, interactive case studies and scenarios, um, online games as well. Um, so we can gamify the process of, of civic learning too, um, that allows students to learn about the issues at hand and then practice their skills and their civic skills. Um, so if we're going to use models and simulations of democratic processes that we need to put aside sufficient time for each of these models or these simulations um, so that the students can learn the skills and the concepts and build the background knowledge that they need to be successful for the model or the simulation. Um, we also want to talk about how the lessons that our students learn in the simulation could apply to other contexts. So we want to transfer that knowledge to um, and get them to transfer that knowledge. Um, so how does this apply to our local, your local community, or how does it apply to the broader, you know, society or, you know, state community or country? Um, so get them to think about, you know, the relevance of what they're doing. Um, and then also create some time for them to reflect on and to process what they've done um, to understand the con their concepts and the application of the simulations. Service learning is another option. Um, so with this educational experience, they participate, students participate in some sort of organized service activity um, within the community. And they reflect on that as a way to gain some more understanding of their course content and maybe the broader application of the discipline and obviously an enhanced sense of what their civic responsibility is. Um, so this is a way to engage our students in learning and to really show them the application outside of the classroom um, and help them connect uh, make those connections between what they're learning in the classroom um, and what they do outside of the classroom um, so according to um, let me give you this link here So according to Indiana University, um, they talk about how service learning can contribute to civic learning um, and that engaged learning, they say, is a gateway to the desired outcomes of the college. Um, and they argue that students who engage more frequently and educationally at purposeful activities, both in and outside of the classroom, get better grades, are more satisfied, and are more likely to persist and graduate. Um, so it, it's that meaning making. Um, what is this, you know, what's the meaning of what I'm learning? Um, and when we do things like service learning or practical application, um, you know, experiential learning as well, which we'll talk about, that's all contributing to that meaning making for students. And then, as I mentioned, experiential learning. Um, so some examples of experiential learning would be um, action civics. So students with that would learn about and then take action on issues within the community. So that's something, you know, particularly meaningful because they're actually getting involved. It's not a scenario. It's not a hypothetical. It's an actual. Um, they could do things like serving as a poll worker or they could participate in student governance or school or district based decision making, um, you know, attending, for example, um, you know, local school board meetings um, and seeing what that process is like and, and participating in that. Um, 
so with experiential learning, what we're doing is offering students authentic ways to explore democracy and behave as civic actors. Um, so this can have to do with elections, but it can also have to do with, you know, just kind of the day to day of, of our democracy and governance. Um, so according to Teaching for Democracy, um, they provide some research. Um, they say since 2003, there's been a consensus in the field of civic learning that six promising practices, um, which are later renamed six proven practices, are effective when done well. Um, and then out of the full list, um, which was expanded to 10 practices in 2017, so out of that full list, five recommended practices entail experiential learning. Um, and one of those is service learning, which is a type of experiential learning, um, student led voluntary associations, student voice in schools, simulations of adult civic roles and action civics. And then they go on to um, cite research about how students who receive both traditional and interactive civics score the highest on assessments and demonstrate high levels of 21st century skills like critical thinking, news comprehension and work ethic. So you can, you know, incorporate this into your assessment practices. Um, you can offer extracurricular activities that provide opportunities for your students to get involved, either in, at the school level or the community level or the national political level as well. Um, so this is where, again, we're encouraging our students to apply what they learn in our class to, our, to the real life context. And, or making those connections or helping them make those connections for themselves and connect, you know, whatever the discipline is to, you know, how it helps them be more civic minded and participate in civics. Um, civic online reasoning is another example of a strategy that we could use. Um, and this comes from the core curriculum, COR. Um, this comes from Stanford, so I'll share that link there, core.stanford.edu. Uh, and according to this website, um, they, they talk about University of Connecticut professor Michael Lynch, um, who called the internet, quote, both the world's best fact checker and the world's best bias confirmer often at the same time. Um, so that's, we're going into the virtual realm where many of our students live most of the time um, and looking at their civic online reasoning and building those skills. Um, so looking for reliable information, um, looking to uh, avoid confirmation bias. Um, so, the goal of this is to get students to recognize and be able to find reliable information, for example, like uh, with civic health, um, what clean water and proper sanitation are to public health. Um, so with that information, what do they do? So then they want, we wanted to make them smarter, better informed, um, and what can the response be and how can they get involved in making things better? Um, so we often think of our students as quote unquote digital natives um, and they can they can navigate apps very well. Um, they can navigate social media well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can recognize misinformation or echo chambers or, um, you know, that they're immune to confirmation bias. Um, so evaluating information is what civic online reasoning aims to help students develop uh, more of so that they can be better um, civic participants and leaders. Um, so for one example, the .org, and this is something that I teach my students. Um, students are often taught, and I know students are still taught this because my students still are surprised by this um, when I tell them that the .org is meaningless. Um, but they're taught .org means that it's a nonprofit 
and that the information is credible. And that's just not true because anyone can purchase a .org and pay for it. Um, so that's just like one very small example, one small piece of, of something that, you know, students get things stuck in their heads or they're taught certain things that might go against, you know, the ability for them to um, evaluate source material well and effectively. Um, and then that in turn affects the value of the information, the quality of the information that they're collecting. And then, you know, if they're collecting misinformation and believing that to be true, that affects how well they participate in democracy. So basically, we want to give them kind of a license to drive um, the information superhighway um, and helping them, you know, study for that test and pass that test and get that license. So that they are educated and responsible civic participants and leaders. Um, another strategy is participation in school governance. Um, so encouraging students to um, that, you know, they can participate in school governance. Um, you know, they can run for school office. Um, there's student council, there's advisory boards, there's department committees. Um, so how can students get involved? Um, we, we might think student council is the only way, but there are different ways. So, you know, there's often student representation on other committees um, at the university, for example. So what are some ideas for students to get involved on campus? How can they get involved? Um, and students have ideas. They have good ideas on how to improve their schools um, and they can they can help take action and, and come up with solutions. Um, so that allows them to practice their civic skills within a controlled environment, um, a, an educational environment, um, and they can learn from those experiences um, and then translate that beyond the classroom, beyond um, you know, their college experience or their school experience into the real world. Um, so what are some approaches that you could take in your discipline specifically? Were any of the approaches mentioned, um, things that might work for you? Um, you know, do you have any additional ideas that popped up as you were listening today? So you can um, post the chat. I'll, I'll wait a couple of minutes or you can unmute if you want to and you can speak with your mic. Great, thank you, Alina. Um, classroom instruction, so discussing um, intersections between music and politics, and music is political, right? Um, participation in music advisory boards at the school level, uh, media literacy skills for research projects, all great ideas and great applications within music. Oops, didn't mean to switch that. Um, Writing a policy support letter to legislators. That's a great idea, Kimberly. Um, and Stephanie coming from K-12. Um, having the class decide on basic classroom rules for discussion and interactions with one another and then decide on those norms. That's a great idea as well. And definitely um, age appropriate um, and something. Yeah, definitely gives them ownership over their learning environment. That's, you know, anytime we can give our students some autonomy um, and some ownership over their learning, they're going to be more invested in in that learning because they feel that that it belongs to them. 
Great. Any other thoughts before we move on to some uh, considerations, some challenges that we might face? All right, well, if you think of anything, pop it there in the chat and I will um, I will address it as it comes up. So the last part of the workshop, we'll go over some of the challenges that are facing civic education. We'll look at a specific resource that we can use um, to face those challenges and then um, see, I'll, I'll show you a list of the resources that I use to develop this workshop and I'll share those out um, as well if you're um, in this workshop live, I will send out those in the follow-up email. Um, and then there will be an opportunity for anybody to ask questions before we close out the workshop today. Um, so in her essay, The Challenges of Facing Civic Education in the 21st Century, Kathleen Hall Jameson laid out five fundamental challenges that are confronting reformers working to improve the quality and accessibility of civic education in school. And these are those challenges. Um, so one challenge is that ensuring a civic education or, or that civic education is high quality hasn't been a state or a federal priority. Um, and we know that state and federal priorities often reflect what happens in the classroom or what's prioritized in the classroom. Um, um, and thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, there are a lot of opportunities in the DeKalb community um, and the school district for NIU students to get involved and to make changes. Absolutely. Um, Another challenge of civic education is social studies textbooks, um, which, you know, depending on the textbook that's chosen, it might not facilitate the development of necessary civic skills. Um, also, a challenge might be that upper income students might be better or are, it's not might be, they are better served by our schools, both generally and specifically with regard to civic education than lower income students. Um, and this is an inequity that definitely needs to be addressed on a systemic level. Another challenge is um, cutbacks and funds for schools, um, school funding cutbacks. Um, and that makes implementing changes in, in any sort of educational changes, but specifically civics education changes very difficult. Um, and then finally, just the polarized political climate that we are increasingly experiencing in the United States increases the likelihood that curricular changes will be cast as advancing a partisan agenda. Um, so, um, you know, and with, with particularly with in regard to civic education, um, you know, casting it as, um, you know, advancing, especially if you're focusing on um, at the same time, uh, implementing civic education, but also uh, fighting for equity and funding for, you know, students, um, for schools, um, you know, however you present it and whatever um, efforts you use to pair it with um, can be twisted and, <clears throat> and can be um, accused, you can be accused of advancing uh, some sort of partisan agenda. Um, <clears throat> So reform efforts complicated because um, it can be overlooked. Um, you know, many support the idea that quality civic education is important um, to our democracy, but authentic support is different than you know lip service, right? Um, and we need to move beyond just the one shot at American government class in you know, 11th or 12th grade um, and towards it really integrating um, civic education into all disciplines um, and showing students through you know, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, learning that you know, all of these things are connected and particularly education is connected to not just getting a job after they graduate, but also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but also participating in democracy. Um, and then that's, you know, the real value of uh, higher education or education just in general throughout um, and a quality education. So we need to make that equity um, and that equality prevalent. 
Um, so here's a resource um, highlight. This is the ECS and, and CLC's uh, guidebook, guidebook, Six Proven Practices for Effective Civic Learning. Um, I'll share this with you in the chat here. Um, and then again, in my follow-up email. Um, but you can read through the, the broader document, but basically the six practices for effective civic learning, learning include, um, and this is kind of review and, and summary, but providing instruction in government law, history, law, and democracy. Um, and again, you can do those things um, in ways that are applicable regardless of you know, what your, your discipline is. So for music, for example, you know, what are some of the government history, law, democracy implications um, uh, of music history, music, music and government, music and law. Um, second practice is to incorporate discussion of current local, national and international issues and events in the classroom, particularly those that young people view as important to their lives. Um, the third is to design and implement programs that provide students with opportunities to apply what they learn. So they shouldn't just learn the things, they should apply the things that they've learned um, through performing community service that's linked to the formal curriculum and classroom instruction. So um, we want all of these things to be connected together um, explicitly for students. Um, the fourth practice is offering extracurricular activities that provide opportunities for young people to get involved in their schools or communities. The fifth is to encourage student participation in school governance. And then the sixth is to encourage students participation in simulations of democratic processes and procedures. So some of the resources that I've used in developing um, this workshop, I will share with you um, again uh, in my follow-up email if you're at the workshop here today. Otherwise, they're there up on the screen if you're watching the recording. Um, and you can always contact me as well. Um, if you need any of these resources um, and you're watching the recording afterward. Um, so if we have any questions, you can post them in the chat or raise your hand to use the microphone. Um, I'll pause for a minute to see if anyone has questions um, or if you have a request for any resources, additional resources, um, let me know that too, or discipline specific resources, I can share those with you as well. All right, if you do have any questions, I will stick around, but thank you for attending today's presentation and exploring some ways that we can in integrate civic learning in our courses uh, to provide students with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be active, informed citizens.